the Columbia Workshop, under the direction of Irving Reese. High up on a building on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, immortalized in granite are these words of Abraham Lincoln's. The patent system added the fuel of interest to the fire of genius. The American patent system is perhaps the strongest single bulwark of democratic government. Under its protection and encouragement, inventive genius flourished and made of a small, struggling nation the greatest industrial power in the history of the world. Because of the contribution of the American patent system to civilization, the Columbia Workshop is proud to dedicate this program to the 100th anniversary celebration of the United States Patent Office. Let us turn back the pages of history to Venice in 1594. In the hall of the Doge, a young man fingers a petition nervously while a group of nobles stare. Very well, I am ready. Speak up, young man. If it please, Your Highness, I have prepared a paper. Then read it quickly. Uh, Yes, Your Highness. Your humble servant has invented a machine for raising water and irrigating land at small expense and great convenience. It seems not fit that this invention which is my own, discovered by me with great labor and much expense, be made the common property of everybody. I humbly petition, Your Serene Highness, that you deign to favor me with a right so that no one but myself or my heirs be allowed to make this new instrument. By reason of your benignity thereof, I shall more attentively apply myself to new inventions for universal benefit. Yes, go on. That is all, my lord. You believe, then, that if I grant this right, you will apply yourself to other beneficial inventions? Yes, Your Highness. Very well. Scribe. Your Highness? Cause to be entered that from this day on, for 20 years, no other man shall have the right to make this machine. Yes, Your Highness. Your name, Galilei Galileo. On the fruits of Galileo's promise, I shall more attentively apply myself to new inventions for universal benefit. The world has long been aware. Thus was a young man, destined to be one of the world's greatest scientific minds, encouraged by the doors of Venice. But such was not the case with other all-powerful nobles, or in other countries, and such great abuses existed under governments in which one person had the power to create or destroy inventors' rights based on whim or favor, that few were encouraged to devote their energies toward a named Eli Whitney, first out of Yale, left for Savannah, Georgia, to visit the cotton plantation of his friend, Mrs. Nathaniel Green. It is an afternoon in the summer of 1792. Young Whitney, who has shown a marked aptitude for mechanical design, watches a group of Negroes in the shed of the plantation. This is Mr. Stiles, Mr. Whitney, my overseer. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Stiles? How do you do, sir? Your people work hard here. Yes, sir. Seed and cotton takes a long time, and we've got shipments to make regularly. Uh, tell me, do they have to pick each seed out of a cotton ball by hand? Yes, sir. Well, it seems there should be some easier way of doing it. Well, it's hardly possible. A machine had damaged the tender fibers. I wager Mr. Whitney could make a machine that would. He'd made some very clever things for me. He would earn the gratitude of the whole South. It might be done. Oh, oh, no, Eli. You're here for a vacation. I won't have you worrying about cotton. Why, a machine could do all that work in an hour. Why, George, I will do it. The back-breaking burden of the Negro slaves preyed on the mind of Eli Whitney. In five weeks, he carried a strange-looking spike roller into the shed. Hello, Mr. Whitney. Hello, Mr. Stiles. Uh, could I interrupt your work for a few moments? Why, yes, sir. All right, boys. Take a rest. Well, what's that you've got there, Mr. Whitney? That's a cotton gin, Mr. Stiles. Cotton I gin? think it may work. Uh, may I set it here? Sure, set it right down here. Now, uh, can, can you have one of the slaves bring me a basket of cotton bowls? Well, uh, I assure Mrs. Green won't mind. You know, cotton's pretty expensive in those spikes. Mr. Bell, if Mrs. Hewitt hears this, we'll be thrown out, apparatus and all. We'd better go to bed and start again early tomorrow. Uh, what, uh... Oh, nothing. Uh, there, that little thumbscrew will hold. If 
I could only stretch that diaphragm a wee bit tighter. Oh, confound that hammer. There goes our room and board. Eh, why? Mrs. Hewitt has complained three times this week about the noise. There, she's coming up the stairs now. Well, I'll run into the front room, hook up that old battery, and make the adjustments. I'll fix the transmitter in there. We can make a test after you get rid of her. After I... Come in. Ah, good evening, Mrs. Hewitt. Please come in. It's not evening, Mr. Watson. It's night. You and your friend will have to stop that noise. Oh, yes, Mrs. Stewart. We'll and stop if you right keep up, uh... burning the gas this late, I'll have to increase your rent. Well, of course we And the way you litter to... this room with all those wires. What are you men doing? Mrs. Hewitt, Mr. Bell is a great man. Someday, maybe the world will remember that this house, because of these wires... Someday the world will be able to talk through these wires, Mrs. Hewitt. Mr. Watson, you've been drinking. No, Mrs. Hewitt, think of it. People will be able to hear through it for blocks all the way from Boston to New York. Uh, will you please hold this wire? I, I've got to tighten the connection. Oh, all right. But why can't your friend hold it? Well, Mr. Bell's in the front room making the connection. <gasps> oh, the wire's alive. It bit me. Oh, I'm sorry. <sighs> it, it was an accident. Mr. Bell must have opened the circuit. I wonder why... Mr. Watson, just... Mr. Watson, come here, I want you. Why, that's Mr. Bell's voice. I thought he was in the front room. Listen. Mr. Watson, come here. We talked to Mrs. Franklin Harris on board the Aquitania. they are about 1,200 miles at sea now. The Aquitania. One moment, please. It is long distance. Operator, this is the Amalgamated Smelling Company. Please cross the next hour offices in Seattle, San Diego, Chicago, Baltimore, and Tampa for a conference call. Just a moment, please. So the few feet of wire which carried the first words of Alexander Graham Bell accidentally, after he had spilled some acid and called for his assistant, spread into a network of 150 million miles of lines over five continents, carrying 69 million calls a day. But if the first words carried over a line were strange, stranger words still signalized another historic milestone in American invention less than a year later. It is the last... And try yes, to sir. keep the revolutions uniform about uh, one a second. Right. I'll have to bend close to the mouthpiece. Are you ready? Uh, yes, sir. But what will you say? Uh, I hadn't thought of that. Uh, let me see. Uh, uh, I've got it. Ready, Weaver. Turn. Mary had a little lamb. Its fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. All right, Weaver, that's enough. Now, those Macintosh apples, Tom, or Rome beauties? Yes, and you'll have to transport them to our homes, Tom. <laughs> uh, we'll use the two dollars to buy more tin for Weaver. Uh, just throw the cigars out. <laughs> now, uh, now we'll set the needle back. Now, when I signal, turn the crank at the same speed. Would you like to listen, Mister Cruzy, and you too, Carmen? Oh, sure. Oh, sure, of course. Hold this to your ear. Already, Weaver. Turn. <laughs> so, I hope they're good apples. <laughs> the words of a nursery rhyme. Man's voice was first captured and imprisoned on a sheet of tin foil. From its humble beginning, like all great new inventions, it inspired a host of other inventions, culminating with the sound motion picture. Edison's phonograph have the irate gods melt his wings and plunge him to his doom. Man has been rebuked for centuries for attempting to soar. It is a far cry from the songs of Ovid in ancient Rome and the dreams of Da Vinci in Florence 400 years ago to a bicycle repair shop in Dayton, Ohio, in 1902, where two brothers talk while working. Here comes Father, Wilbur. Is his bike ready? Yep, just finished. Catherine's with him. Good. Hello, Father. Hello, Hello Catherine. Boy. Hello. Your bicycle's finished, Father. Well, I didn't come about that. Uh, anything wrong? Boys, you will have to stop those glider flights. 
You've been disappointing the village undertaker for months. They couldn't stop now, Father. Oh, it's too late to quit. Your business is going to pieces. You're the laughing stock of the whole town. You'll both break your necks before you finish. Please, Father. You've already flown the glider. You found out that it stays up. What are you after now? Power. Stand here, fellas. Hey, right. Sure, sure. What do you want us to do? We want to lift this machine on the track. It weighs 750 pounds. But if the seven of us help, it shouldn't be hard. Oh, is that all? Heck, I can lift it myself. <laughs> all right, say when. No, 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 over there. All right, all together now. Come on, lift. Come on, up with it. Good. Now, ease her down now. Easy. 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 Yeah. Thanks very much, boys. Oh, that's all right. All right, that's Wilbur. Strap yourself in. No, no, Orville. We tossed the coin four days ago. But you won then, Will. Well, I had my chance. That restraining wire slipped. Yes, I know, and you didn't go up. So it's still your chance. Now, don't argue. We've waited long enough. Get in. As you say. Strap? Yep. You got the benzene on? Benzene on. Got the switch on? Switch on. Give the propeller a crank. All right. <clears throat> Let him warm up a bit, Orville. All right. Mr. Wright, uh, Mr. Wright, yes? I'd like to have a word with you. Uh, I'm Haynes, it's Fred. Yeah, sure, Mr. Haynes. Uh, would you mind stepping over here? We'll never hear each other. Not at all. Now, what can I do for you? Well, Mr. Wright, I want to be fair about all of this in my paper, but... You fellas don't really think that that'll lift off the ground, do you? Well, can't really say, Mr. Haynes. We think it will. But you'll be able to tell in a minute. But I think that... Will. Will. All right, Orville. Coming. Sorry, Mr. Haynes. i got to see my brother. Well, do you think they'll make it, Haynes? Well, I, I think they're darn food. What, what do you say? I can't say. Gosh almighty, they deserve to. After all that work. Good luck! Why, even if it stayed up longer? Well, the dang thing's too dangerous for any good. Besides, it couldn't go more than a few miles, and the new auto's dangerous enough for that. No, no, I, I don't think it'll mount much. Come on, Fred! Come on! Come on! Ah, uh, the Ah, uh, the Passing chance for Honolulu. Midway Island. Weak Island. Guam. Manila. Canton, China. All aboard for the China Clipper. Slowly, gracefully, the 25-ton multi-motor bird skids along the waters of San Francisco Bay, dips under the new bridge, rises to the infinite blue, points its proud of China and to Macklin, first assistant commissioner of the United States Patent Office, who will tell you something of the future of the patent system. We now transfer you to Washington, D.C. The variety of inventions and experiences of the past have frequently led to the question, has everything of any importance been invented? Those who have studied the history of inventions answer emphatically no. In 1845, the first commissioner, Patton Ellsworth, said his resignation was of no great concern because mankind had achieved all of which it was capable, at least in the direction of material perfection. Since then, we have seen the telegraph span continents and oceans. Then came the telephone and later the radio. At a time of the beginning of the radio, with its dot and dash signals from station to station and from ship to shore, the horseless carriage clattered down our streets. Even at that time, the future will cross continents and oceans on pathways as definite as to altitudes and direction as the straightest railway track. Great airships will take off and land with the accuracy of the schedule of commuters' trains, day and night, in clear weather, fog, or storm. The number of our airports will, of course, greatly increase. Automobile transportation, as we know it today, has many problems which must be solved. The problems of road crossings and of automobile parking and storage need only to be thought of as having been worked out ideally to envision the actual conditions in a very short time. For example, automobile parking and storage in the cities will be like the handling of airplanes on an airplane carrier. Driving to the hotel or theater, one will step out of his car and it will drop from sight to be returned to the owner promptly on call. We're all looking forward to the advent of television. 
developments in the photoelectric cell and other electrical marvels are bringing practical use of television nearer every day. Soon television will take us to the scene of action of news events of peace or war, accident or parade. We may watch distant football games now where we only listen. In the realms of science, we may expect many surprises. For instance, in the near future, electrical microscopes will give us details of minute wonders, seen with enlargements many times that of which glass lenses are now capable. And by the same token, electrical telescopes may take us hundreds of millions of light years of distance farther out into the universe. We will also be able to see in the dark. With all these things, there must follow the development of human engineering. Our relations to each other in the community, state, and nation must be studied and improved in proportion to our development of instrumentalities which serve man. Not only will man... Tune in next week for the workshop's presentation of one of the outstanding experimental dramatic scripts, Rhythm of the Jute Mill, by William Robson. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.